Yeah, welcome everybody. Um, I am the civic, my name is Sam Strukens. I'm the civic engagement director for the League of Women Voters of Minnesota. And I have um, Paul Huffman with me today uh, and he will introduce himself, um, but is the election and redistricting policy coordinator. Um, and we're gonna talk about the 2024 legislative session and as it just wrapped up this week and um, there were many important changes and things that uh, updates on our priorities um, that, uh, that 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 may not have passed. So um, we're going to share um, that today. And our agenda is to talk first about um, many of you on this call uh, know about our advocacy at the Capitol, but I'll we'll go over some of the impacts we had, some of the numbers, um, and the the difference that we made. Um, and also give you um, some places where you could look for more information. Um, also, we'll talk specifically about our legislative priorities. Uh, so at the beginning of the year, we prioritized um, redistricting, we prioritized the Equal Rights Amendment, climate change, and then um, other statewide priorities, um, especially related to our um, democracy work, um, and then a few other issues. Um, and then finally, talk about um, and ongoing advocacy that uh, the League of Women Voters Minnesota does outside of the legislative session and then uh, into next year. So what does our advocacy look like um, for the at the Capitol? Uh, we look to our local leagues to interview uh, their legislators uh, before the session starts um, or, or even in the first few weeks of session. Uh, just to get a um, get a basis of the issues that will be prioritized and also to hear where they stand on our priorities as well. Um, and that helps uh, us to see and to communicate with them throughout uh, the session. Also, our observer and lobby core, uh, as you can see here in this picture from 20 at the end of the 2023 session, uh, we have about 20 folks who meet every week. Um, and a lot of you are on this call. So thank you for all the advocacy that you do throughout the session. Um, and if you are interested in joining us next year, um, it's really fun. Um, we learn more just about the legislative process um, and also talk uh, specifically about actions that we should take and ways that we can uh, provide information to members through our observer reports um, that gets shared in our capital letter. So. That is uh, something that the League has had for the past few years. Um, it's actually a trademark. Um, and uh, this goes out every week um, to share what our um, Observer Corps members um, reported on and also uh, some of our advocacy at the Capitol. So many of you may be aware of a lot of the issues that we'll talk about today just because you've been reading our Capitol letter. And also I try to share uh, various um, news sources and the coverage that our wonderful um, reporters do here in Minnesota, um, both um, mostly at the Capitol and then uh, outside um, how these will impact our communities. Um, also, you know, with Paul, especially on our staff, uh, we really submitted a lot of written testimony this year uh, to show why the League supports certain um, bills. And this uh, really helps, I think, lift up our voice and its importance in in our mission and shows uh, that, you know, our membership stands behind basic because of our program for action stands behind these issues and really uh, strengthens our support for them. And, and similarly, we have partners and coalitions that will ask for us to sign our organization name, and that allows um, legislators to see um, that there's a, a groundswell of support from many different plates of many different organizations. And uh, this is a way for us to also just coordinate our advocacy, uh, especially around like uh, climate change, where it's not a top priority for us, or it's not our top priority, but we are able to still um, show uh, how that organization supports legislation. And action alerts, we sent out almost 2000 uh, messages uh, to legislators. Um, so that is a really uh, great way for us to take action um, and across the organization to um, all parts of the state. 
um, as we uh, push some of these issues. And I know I've heard some feedback from a few of you where legislators respond to these and kind of um, helps to see where, they, where they're at as well. And I'm sure, you know, just based on all of the legislative assistants who help to get, you know, they get 20 emails on like the ERA that uh, definitely would um, be lifted up and could make a difference um, when during debate and definitely shows and even just one message will show uh, that uh, it's important. So hopefully these were helpful to you all and I will continue to do those. Um, and then also our rallies. Um, we really rallied for the ERA hard this year um, from the beginning of session and we'll get into um, the specific specifics on that bill. Um, but there was a great, awesome, great show of support where we, um, you know, we, this been an issue we've been following for a long time. So us being at the Capitol really lifts up, uh, our support and shows that, um, you know, we are able to, to get down and, and our, our, and face to face can, can show and get good press, um, as well as, uh, making, being hard to ignore when we're chanting and, uh, it's always fun. So now I'm going to hand it to Paul to get into um, election policies. All right. Thanks, Sam. And uh, what I'm going to talk about here is, you know, the the uh, things that passed. I will also talk about some things that were introduced that did not pass that were either our priorities or things that we supported. Um, as Sam said, you know, I know a lot of you are into the details on some aspects of election and democracy policies um, and may know more than we do. Uh, so if there's something that uh, we don't include or or uh, may miss, just uh, please feel free to to ask a question, uh, raise your hand or put something in the chat if you have a question. Uh, and I, I'll ask Sam to keep an eye and let me know if there is a question. Uh, m almost all of the, uh, well, let me rephrase that, all of the things that passed related to election democracy changes, policies, were in the elections omnibus. Um, this page is a summary of the highest priority or the most important items that I think um, are relevant to league members and voters with regards to election changes from the omnibus. Uh, you know, the first three items uh, I'll talk some more detail about. Uh, there are lots more things in the elections omnibus, um, you know, that are really important to, to people, uh, but not more generally as important. Um, so just briefly going through the things that were included, uh, the, uh, you know, the Minnesota Voting Rights Act, and that is uh, uh, a, a policy that essentially enshrines our, uh, Article 2 of the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965 into Minnesota state law and establishes a private right to action. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Very important uh, legislation uh, if we use it. Um, the second thing, and this is something we've been uh, pursuing for a long time, is uh, ending prison gerrymandering, uh, ensuring that we count people who are uh, incarcerated where they came from and not where the prison is. I'll talk a little more about that. That'll be applicable in the next redistricting cycle. And then the last thing is campus voting locations. Uh, that was something that's uh, very important to uh, ensuring access to young people on college campuses. We'll talk again some more about that in a, a later slide. And that'll be effective in 2025. Uh, some other things that were noteworthy in the uh, on the bus, again, this is not all inclusive. Uh, one is voter registration using descriptions of residence location. This is something that is already done. Um, by local election officials. Uh, Chair Freiberg pointed out last night it's required by federal law. You cannot disenfranchise somebody because either they don't have a home or they don't have a home address. Um, and But we lack that formal means within our process in Minnesota to document the location of a residence in some form other than just an address like you use for 911. So this just requires that our state forms include that. This actually had the most attention uh, by the minority party in the House uh, floor uh, debate 
on the election omnibus, uh, which is ironic again, because it's required by federal law. And the, and the alternative is to disenfranchise people who don't have a home address, which would be unconstitutional. So, but just so you're aware, this is this is a very hot issue for some people, uh, a potential source of some misunderstanding and misinformation about what this does. But it really assures that when local election officials are identifying where somebody lives, they're giving them the correct ballot because they're in the correct precinct. Um, and that really is what this comes down to is making sure people are eligible to vote and get the correct ballot. Another one is uh, expanding uh, the uh, requirements for providing uh, voter registration in secondary schools, opportunities careers uh, in May and September uh, that all 16 and 17 year olds eligible to register to vote are given the opportunity through paper or online means. Um, we question came up last night when we were in Golden Valley, you know, can the league help with this? The law is not prescriptive about how schools do this. Um, so certainly this is an opportunity to support schools or student organizations in doing that uh, voter registration outreach. Um, there were significant changes in the protection of voter public information lists. If you remember from the last session, a lot of these things are expanding on or clarifying some requirements from uh, last session's changes, which were very extensive. Um, there was a lot of discussion last se session about availability of voter lists and uh, to political parties or other groups. Um, that was specified. What got clarified in this bill this year is what they can do with those public information lists. Specifically, it can only be used for internal purposes, for uh, developing canvas lists, for uh, developing outreach planning. It cannot, those things, those lists cannot be publicized, sold, shared, put on the internet. Um, they only can be used internally by those organizations. So additional protection for voter information. Um, prohibitions, additional prohibitions on deep fakes uh, influencing elections, uh, very important. And we've seen more of that. And, and I mean, just as a daily item, we talk about artificial intelligence and ability to uh, create uh, uh, media that can represent candidates and individuals saying and do things that they just didn't do. Um, and I saw a news article this morning indicating somebody who who created a fake phone call from President Biden for a campaign um, is going to be fined up to a million dollars for that activity. So this is, again, trying to get ahead of or catch up to the deep fakes and AI and, and things that are happening uh, in technology. Uh, if you pursue the uh, election, post-election reviews and are part of that process, uh, there are changes in the timelines and the conduct of uh, post-election canvas at the state level, uh, recounts, electoral uh, uh, college recounts, and certification of electors. And this is all around complying with the Electoral Count uh, Act uh, that was uh, done uh, last year, I think it was, 22-23, um, to address some of that uncertainty that occurred around the uh, inauguration in 2021. Um, and then finally, there were a number of things that happened with changes in funds uh, for local election officials. There were very tight constraints on how much uh, money that could be spent this year. Um, and this is for the legislature as a whole. Uh, but, you know, in the election policy area, that was true. Um, in this case, um, there was a shift. And uh, if you are into those details, uh, historically, Secretary of State's office has had funds for election equipment procurement and a separate uh, pot of money for local election officials for the conduct of elections and voter service. Uh, all of that election equipment money was moved over into the pot for uh, election officials and election uh, and voter support. Uh, that's important because with a lot of the changes that occurred last year, uh, that there's a lot of need for local election officials to have as much flexibility as they can in how they use funding in order to uh, address and implement those changes. So 
Uh, other things, there was some additional money for implementation of the Restore the Vote uh, uh, activity last year. There's money that was uh, uh, approved uh, for, authorized for the uh, campus voting location. So uh, some amount of money there, but not a huge sum. So Sam, next slide. All right. Now the things, the Minnesota Voting Rights Act, this is what passed. We're still in the things that did get implemented. And I just, you know, we could spend the whole uh, time today just talking about the Minnesota Voting Rights Act, what's in it, uh, what it means, how it gets implemented. We'll be doing more communication about that going forward. Uh, just some background on what this is and why it matters. Um, many of you may be aware of the Federal Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals ruling last fall. I think it was in October or early November that identified that that court felt there was no private right to action to uh, make claims against the Federal Voting Rights Act of 1965. That act is almost 60 years old, and there have been claims by groups and individuals for decades under that. Uh, but this Court of Appeals you know, determined that that was incorrect and that because it wasn't specifically spelled out in the legislation, that was not acceptable. Um, there are a number of states that have enacted uh, state voting rights acts, um, you know, and one of the things that why that became urgent in Minnesota is because we're in the Eighth Circuit, and the Eighth Circuit's position is that only the Department of Justice can inform voting rights claims. This hasn't historically been a big issue in Minnesota, but it is important from a preventative standpoint and also to enable uh, people in the state to take action as needed. Now, as far as other states with similar legislation, uh, California, Washington, Oregon, Connecticut, New York have all passed similar legislation. Uh, Maryland has been working on this. Uh, it's pending in New Jersey and Michigan. Uh, so this has moved in a number of states, slightly different in a number of these states. Uh, and I've been working on what the comparisons are and the similarities. So we're not the first, uh, probably not the last. Uh, but again, this is uh, uh, something that's a state uh, nationwide uh, move in order to uh, reinforce and codify those individual rights within individual states, given the federal uh, erosion of the Voting Rights Act. Um, key elements of this bill, uh, just at a very high level, it deals with two key things out of Article Two of the, vote, the Federal Voting Rights Act: voter suppression, policies and practices that could uh, could uh, impact people's ability to vote, their right to vote, either by reducing polling places, reducing uh, staffing of polling places, moving polling places, ineffective communication uh, at a local level. At a state level, it could be practices that disproportionately burden uh, protected groups. Uh, the bill refers to protected classes of individuals and specifically calls out specific protected classes as covered by this. So uh, there could be things at a state or local level from a policies or practice standpoint that causes impacts people's ability to vote. The other thing is vote dilution. And this is where, in particular with municipalities, or local governmental units, think school boards, where elections are conformed on an at-large basis, that can dilute the votes of protected groups of people, minorities, uh, immigrants, uh, you know, uh, non-native language speakers, others, to elect candidates of their preference. Um, and that has resulted in a number of states in creation of electoral districts in cities. Uh, and so, that vote dilution, the ability of minorities and protected groups to elect candidates of their choosing, either alone or in coalition, is really important in this. So that is the other element out of Article 2. As I said, it creates that private right to action that people have so that individuals or groups representing classes of individuals, think the League of Women Voters, Common Cause, ACLU, groups like that, can file suit. It's not just up to the state uh, attorney general or the federal uh, uh, department of justice that provides, I go back to that vote dilution. And one of the things that I work on is 
as local redistricting quite extensively. I did that during the 21-22 cycle. I continue to do that working with legislators and local communities. Um, that that this addressing vote dilution creates a potential to need to establish wards uh, in cities. In Minnesota, historically, you can only establish wards by becoming a charter city. Any of you who live in charter cities, uh, it is very infrequent that cities go through this chartering process. There's a lot of administrative burden. Uh, running a charter commission is also a very administratively uh, intensive uh, process for a city. So uh, what was done through this is establishing a process to create wards in statutory cities. And this includes both in response to a State Voting Rights Act claim, as well as without the Voting Rights Act claim, either through a petition from voters or through action of a city council. So that was really important. That's something that we as the league were very engaged with, uh, legislators, uh, external groups, lobbyists, and others on, on uh, crafting that language. Um, one thing I jumped past here, I apologize, is the pre-suit notice. Something that the that state uh, Voting Rights Act bills and Minnesota has is, has that isn't in federal legislation is the ability to, to submit what's called a pre-suit notice, which is an individual group can file a claim with a jurisdiction, whether state or local government, saying we believe there is a violation of the Minnesota Voting Rights Act by this policy or practice. And here's the reason we say that. Um, that provides the ability for that jurisdiction, state or local government, to remedy that issue without going to court, without the cost and the time and the burden of, of, spent, of going through that. That is one of the benefits of the State Voting Rights Act is to get this out of federal court, get it in the state court where it's less expensive, more responsive, and that private pre-suit notice allowing people to file suits or, you know, or, or provide notice to quickly and relatively easily uh, make those changes. Um, it was interesting in talking to Chair Freiberg last night that he said, well, there's really been very few nationally uses of state voting rights acts to uh, remedy state voting rights issues. And that's true. I didn't mention to him because we were out of time and um, it was a longer discussion. And talking to uh, voting rights groups in New York, California, Washington, where they find most of the use of this is in the pre-suit notice. So you never get the court where individuals or groups representing individuals file a pre-suit notice, they identify the likely violation of the State Voting Rights Act, and then that jurisdiction takes action to remedy that issue without ever going to court. So that's really important to understand that the really powerful part of this is the pre-suit notice um, in order to take that action in a relatively prompt and less burdensome and costly manner. The last thing, and there was a lot of uh, concern by local governments, cities, counties, uh, MACO, which is the Minnesota Association of County Officers, that's the local election officials, county auditors, elections directors, election managers. Um, they had a lot of concern about uh, their culpability, liability, potential costs, how this would be implemented. Um, a lot of work went in, and, and I have to give credit to Representative Greenman, who I worked with a lot. She worked with a lot of these different groups to uh, balance you know, the various interests uh, and the best practices nationally with how to implement this um, to get us to the point where we had this legislation. Uh, and part of that was providing an avenue for reimbursement of costs for successful challenges. Historically, if you, uh, an individual or a group, files a successful redistricting challenge, for example, uh, of a local or state level redistricting, that is reimbursed by the state. So you don't suffer the cost of having to carry out your own court action as long as you're successful. So that was an important aspect of this. What, what that did was it, while the those local government uh, organizations, the League of Minnesota Cities, Associated Minnesota Counties, MACO, well, they were as happy with this legislation, if you will, 
they clearly recognized the importance of it, the need for the primary to action, and they appreciated the efforts taken to address and mitigate their concerns. So uh, we're still working working through the, the specific wording and how it would be implemented. I'll mention two important things that you may have heard or will hear aren't included. And these are real, you know, one of these is uh, really an Article 5 issue out of the Federal Voting Rights Act, and that's preclearance, where either a state or municipalities have to get pre-approval to make changes. Um, that is present in some states. Uh, Connecticut specifically has that. Um, there really isn't the history of specific documented uh, voting rights uh, infractions in Minnesota. That's not to say there aren't groups and individuals who haven't been impacted by policies and practices in voting rights. It's just that there's not the documentation, there's not the history of legal action to address those. So it's very difficult to come up with well, how would that look. Um, I am talking to ACLU and some other national groups about how that might be structured and uh, discussed and how do we get to that point, but, but we're not there yet. Um, the other aspect of this is a statewide database identifying examples of uh, past issues or structures or policies or practices that would constitute a Voting Rights Act violation. Again, there's not a lot of examples in Minnesota to point at. Generically, there are things such as at-large representation in local municipalities, uh, but that's also something that only one state has approved that. Connecticut hasn't implemented yet. So, you know, again, something we're looking at for the future. Um, so, again, very, there's a lot there. Um, I'm not going to go into more detail. Any questions on the State Voting Rights Act or the other high-level changes before I move on? Yes, uh, Paul, there is one question, but we do kind of got to get moving just quickly. Um, so Mako and League of Minnesota Cities did end up supporting this legislation? I don't know. I, I don't think I'd say they supported it. They said they had concerns, but they also said they recognized the need to, right, need to protect the right to private action. So they they softened their opposition significantly. That, that's I, don't, I don't think they'd say they supported it. I think they they just got a lot of what they wanted. All right, go ahead. Uh, campus voting locations quickly. Um, you know, this was one that there was a lot of discussion. We in the league were very concerned about uh, impacts on local election officials with all the other changes that they are uh, still digesting and implementing. Uh, change management is very difficult and the importance with this upcoming election of making sure that there's a high level of confidence in the manner in which the elections are conducted uh, to trust the outcome. Um, as I said earlier, this will go into effect in 2025, so it's not going to impact 2024 elections. Um, this does require the cities and counties conducting elections provide a polling place for at least one day when requested by a post-secondary institution or a student-led government body. So that does require that. Last year, legislation said counties may do it. Um, the experience has been that counties, you know, for a variety of reasons, have not done that. Um, it does, you know, does require, it's only applicable to institutions providing on-campus housing for at least 100 students, and the location must be agreed to by the institution and the county auditor or city clerk, depending on who's administering the elections. And it also provides the Office of Secretary of State to provide reimbursement to the county and the city for those voting locations. So there were, again, a lot of concern from League of Minnesota Cities, uh, Association of Minnesota Counties, uh, MACO on how this would be implemented, the cost, the burden. Um, the cost is only one thing for them. The other thing for those local uh, organizations, you know, those organizations is the kind of the management or resource burden about uh, putting this together, setting them up, uh, staffing and all of that. So, um, you know, a really good, again, negotiation between legislators and affected groups uh, on this to get this implemented. All right, go ahead. Um, and then also pass prison gerrymandering, high level. This is something that we've had on our radar for a long time. Um, and, and I want to say uh, uh, 
Bobby Joe Champions, president of the Senate. Currently, when he was a representative, he submitted legislation on this back in like 2010. So these things have been out there for a long time. This requires incarcerated individuals to be included where they last resided for the purposes of redistricting, both state and local. So you think about city wards, you think about county commissioners, legislators, congressional districts, all of those now. That'll, that'll count those individuals where they last resided before being incarcerated. And if you look at this, there are, there are large prisons in some rural areas where a significant percentage of the, of the constituents that a relic representative have are not from there, can't vote, and are incarcerated. So this really uh, addresses that, uh, in, uh, that uh, uh, injustice. Uh, federal and state inmates who are not from Minnesota are not included in redistricting in Minnesota, either state or locally. They are included in statewide population count. Bottom line, this does not affect apportionment, how many uh, representatives we get in Minnesota, or federal funding based on uh, population. So those are some things that were initial concerns that people had, not a concern. You know, what ended up in Minnesota, I will credit Common Cause working with Representative Akbaje, who is the lead author on this, um, to make sure this represents the best practices nationally at this point on the prison gerrymandering uh, issue. Okay, go ahead. Now we get into things that didn't pass um, that were priorities. Now, first thing, uh, redistricting, go ahead. Three bills ended up getting uh, introduced this session, very reminiscent of 2019, where once there's activity, then a lot of people come forward. The first thing was the bill that legal and voters and common cause has worked on for the last five years, uh, you know, having to do with uh, a, you know, we call the with us for us redistricting bill with us for us really refers to the fact that it's working with uh, and for impacted communities. Uh, that whole bill has been developed with the perspective inputs concerns of minority impacted communities. Um, had an IRC and advisory commission option in case the, the you know, constitutional amendment doesn't pass. Um, and the structure and process, and as we work through this during the session in the context of other proposals, well, we, we said, and I shared this in testimony in both in the, in the House and several committees, is that this bill, the question is from a very high level, this looks very similar to the three-part constitutional amendment. This is infused with a lot of elements that ensures diversity in the commission, in the public input and participation, and the resultant map. So it's 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 different in the DNA that makes up this, this bill. It has a lot of detail about process, hearings, and public input to assure transparency and participation. And the principles are balanced to ensure fairness and provide the ability to make needed changes. Doesn't restrict us to a least change map. Go ahead. Now, the two other bills, that first bill got a couple of hearings in the House, no hearing in the Senate. Uh, frankly, we were just late on getting our bill introduced. Um, the second bill you probably heard a lot about, go back, please, um, is the three-part good government bill. Um, had a similar uh, but not as robust uh, independent commission. Also included, though, restrictions on legislative lobbying activities and removal of legislative session limits. I can tell you from going to hearings, that legislative limits thing got a ton of attention. And our main concern with this bill, other than the lack of uh, the strong actions to ensure a minority participation and representation, was that legislative session limits. We just felt that that was not the right thing to bundle with the independent commission. So that was our real concern with that. Uh, go ahead. And then the third thing, and this was got introduced late in the session, um, the authors were Representative Torkelson in the House, Senator Rest in the Senate, so bipartisan um, anomaly, I would say. This is called a Bipartisan Redistricting Commission Constitutional Amendment. Uh, it's, a, it's a political commission, an eight-member commission appointed by legislative leaders, very limited exclusions. It limits, it prohibits uh, current elected officials or their families basically is all that's you know, excluded or party officials, but party consultants can participate, staff members can participate. It's it's very much a political structure, had very limited narrow principles, very legalistic, 
Her communities of interest is the bottom priority, no attention to uh, broader minority representation. Uh, this is very much uh, a, a uh, minimal least change map structure. And then no requirements for hearings, public input, public comment. Uh, you do hear legislators who favor, and we could talk about who those are, but they who favor how the court does it. This is a way, and actually the court would have its hands tied with the principles. They, they actually did a lot with the principles to evolve into a much more uh, inclusive and diverse set of principles, uh, focusing on communities and minority representation and American Indian tribal areas. None of that is in this bill. And so if this commission were to not make an agreement, the courts would have their hands tied. And this provides a very strict boundary on on uh, uh, the uh, uh, population variance. So it's really just a very least change map. So uh, we do anticipate that there is a group who's going to continue working on this between sessions. So you stay tuned. And we are going to be working on our bill. Go ahead, Sam. All right. Two other things to didn't pass. The polit online uh, political campaign reimbursement process, something we thought was sure to pass, um, was had been approved for incorporation in the tax omnibus. Um, it did not actually get all the way to the floor in either either chamber as a standalone, um, and that's just really a time management thing from the party. Um, in talking to uh, Chair Freiberg last night about what happened with that. It turns out, and this makes me sense, because I, I watched the uh, the uh, conference committee for the tax bill, and they met at 9.45 on Sunday night uh, to approve the conference report. And they actually took out some things to reduce what was in it. There were still like 1,200 pages, but they took out some things. This is one of those things they took out as seeing as not as critical. So that was really unfortunate, seemed to make a lot of sense and didn't have any significant opposition. The second thing is ranked choice uh, local option. Uh, got to the floor in the House, did not get sufficient yes votes, had a majority but not sufficient yes votes, did not get to the floor in the Senate. Uh, you know, So that's something that is going to continue to be worked on. So that's from the election democracy standpoint what happened. And I'll just briefly open up for questions. All right, Sam, on to you. Oh, Teresa. Um, thanks for this presentation. Next week, um, there's a town hall and we'll be visiting with Representative Torkelson. Uh, I am wondering, should we be kind of pushing him to sit down and look at the better redistricting bills? Or um, it's, it's a disappointment that this was bipartisan and that our own member, <laughs> Senator Rust was supporting it. And uh, anyway, any advice you have? Uh, yeah, I think bring it up because Senator Tor Representative Torkelson, we met with him, uh, uh, Anastasia Bell, Donna Carrera, and I met with him. And he specifically said that there, he's going to be working on this. Um, and, and Senator Rust, we know, is pretty um, not not one of your progressive uh, DFL senators. And and uh, she thinks the current process works just fine. Um, and Representative Torkelson also. Representative Torkelson, here's here's my here's how I articulate this. He is very focused on this being a process by and for legislators. This is a legislator driven regis legislator process. I would tell you that in all redistricting, state and local, there are three stakeholder groups. One is elected officials because they're the ones running. One is electors, election officials, the people administering elections, the House maps are gone. The one that nobody thinks about is the doggone voters. What about the voters? What about the interests of voters? Where are they to come into this process? That bill that he had has no provision for the voters and the needs of the voters. So I think if I were to say, how do we how do we approach folks like Representative Torkelson, who, who is a very principled person, um, I respect Representative Torkelson, I have a very strong difference of opinion on this. I think we need to, to balance that the needs of legislators and interests of legislators with the needs and interests of voters. And how do they come into this? And how do we address that in, in his approach? We feel what we've looked at balances 
the needs of legislators and voters and election officials, as opposed to really being so focused on the the interests of the political parties and the elected officials. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, that was great. Um, and now I will get into some of the other. Um, so yeah, um, Kathleen, I'll come back to you uh, at the end here. But uh, so the Equal Rights Amendment um, was our top priority this session. And we, from the beginning, uh, were advocating for it. Uh, you know, league members came from New Ulm, um, Duluth, you know, all around the metro and, and other places. We had just a really good showing on the first day of February 12th. And then up until the very last hours, um, as you can see, we were watching, you know, Suzanne is here um, observing the Senate because the House ended up passing the amended ERA bill, which more explicitly protected reproductive rights and gender affirming care from what passed the Senate last year. So the Senate had to concur with those changes, um, but they just ran out of time at the end and uh, did not take it up. So the bill um, did not pass. And as you could see in the chat Suzanne put, um, the governor has said he would not call, is not going to call a special session, um, but there are legislators still advocating for that. Um, so it remains to be seen if that will happen. I know there's a number you can call um, if you uh, want to advocate for that. Um, and so, I, I mean, the future is sort of, sort of uncertain um, as to, I mean, what, if this could still get on the 2026 ballot and what the language would look like. Um, but I'd imagine it's, you know, still going to be a top priority for us uh, going forward. It's just disappointing that this year um, it, it was set out to be a priority, but just never, um, never got uh, in front of the Senate. Um, so, uh, well, there's, yeah, we'll, we'll keep going. And um, thank you, um, you know, for everybody for, for advocating for this, uh, this year, and, and especially Suzanne from ERA Minnesota. Um, so uh, climate change, uh, this is what passed. Um, and our main uh, coalition partner is Minnesota Environmental Partnership. So they, um, every, um, you know, week and, and, and with they have multiple um, uh, representatives from organizations around the environmental community and we work with them on some of our priorities. So zero waste, clean water. Um, this year, uh, the Packaging Waste and Cost Reduction Act, which shifts uh, responsibility from uh, consumers to producers and aims to have to reduce, uh, recycle and reuse um, um, with certain exceptions by 2032 uh, of products in Minnesota. Um, and so that that's became law and uh, we were happy to see that along with the electronic waste. Um, many of you know, this is a serious issue for landfills. Um, if, you know, batteries get into them that cause fires and even on fire on garbage trucks, um, you know, this has been happening more and more as, as more things become electronic. Uh, but uh, the bill to um, establish a recycling system for electronic waste to move forward but did not pass this year. Instead, a task force, an advisory task force was created uh, to look at uh, recovering these critical minerals, um, which many of you know can be used for uh, projects such as clean energy um, going forward of, of, of things that we can use in Minnesota. So great progress was made on that. Uh, clean water. Um, reduction goals were set by the state uh, with the use of road salt and nitrogen fertilizer, uh, as well as creating an inventory of public waters along with a definition of, of that. Um, and also um, at this point, Teresa, if there's anything I miss, um, you know, you've, with the Lobby Observer Corps, you've been providing us updates on this, but I also, um, almost 4.5 million was funded uh, in to address uh, nitrate contamination in Southeast Minnesota, where the issue um, of, of nitrogen fertilizer and manure management has really, um, uh, you know, showed the, has really, you know, caused harm to um, those accessing clean water uh, to private well owners in particular. Um, so some, that was really a priority uh, for us and, and steps were made at the, at the legislature this year. 
Um, another thing this year that passed was permitting reform. So I think around $500,000 was, was set aside uh, for the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission, uh, to facilitate permitting reform that will streamline clean energy projects in Minnesota, which is uh, you know important to achieving our goal of that passed last year of 100% clean energy by 2040. Um, and also geothermal grants uh, was, you know, about over a million dollars was invested or uh, given to, uh, will be given to local governments to assess um, the feasibility and cost of, of, of geothermal energy uh, in their communities. Uh, and then another thing that I just really love to see, $12 million was for tree planting, uh, you know, the, the emerald ash borer and storms that have decimated communities um, the, the, that was dedicated. And one other thing, um, there was a policy provision that passed which says um, grants given to beginning farmers uh, should prioritize um, those who lack access to land and markets. Um, so that was a, a change that, that passed an agriculture bill. Just a couple other things to note, um, Amy, the yes, it, it, the, it looks like it all got wrapped into the tax bill, which is F uh, House File 5247. And in addition, um, there is, I believe it's 500,000 for soil health equipment grants targeting the impacted areas in the Southeast. Um, and I can't track this down and I'm, I, I'm gonna have to check it out with MEP. Um, I thought that a provision that restricts the sale of neonicotinoid seed, uh, seeds treated by neonicotinoids um, for non-agricultural use passed like earlier in the session, but it's not in this summary. So I'll check that out. There yeah, was a no. similar proposal banning it for agricultural uses that didn't pass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you'll have to let me know. I, I, I think I, <laughs> I looked through a lot of different things. There's a lot of different places where you know, hard to keep track of what was in the last bill. Um, so there will be more updates uh, and I'll go into how you, you can plug into our climate change work at the end here. Um, so additional issues um, that passed or did not pass, uh, firearms, you know, an issue that the league has followed over the past few years, um, tougher penalties uh, for those purchasing a gun for somebody who's not supposed to have one um, from a misdemeanor to a felony for doing that, and also a ban on um, binary triggers, which uh, is an issue for um, releasing more than one shot and not having it apparently uh, have any control of where that would go, that shot would go. So important uh, changes there uh, to, to make our communities more safe. Um, what did not pass, unfortunately, was the End of Life Options Act. However, um, as we spoke with the bill author, Representative Freiburg in Golden Valley last night, he's you know, not discouraged, like with Restore the Vote and with prison gerrymandering. It takes multiple years for things to be introduced before they ultimately pass. Um, and this uh, bill went through four committees this year uh, in the House, um, but did not get heard in the Senate uh, because similar to the Equal Access to Broadband Act, uh, both of those issues uh, had a few, did not have support from a few key DFL senators, which would give them the majority. Um, and so um, similar to the Equal Access to Broadband Act, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, we really, we were asked to support this um, and we did. We sent a letter because uh, many, um, you know, broadband providers, uh, broadcast candidate forums or uh, local government meetings, which, uh, you know, provides a nonpartisan source of information that's really important to communities. And some of these broadband parents are really struggling. So this bill would have um, enacted a franchise fee on uh, providers, um, which cable providers already have to pay, but not those who, who do provide uh, news through the, the internet. I might be explaining this wrong, but that is how I understand it. Um, and so that there's no fee for those who uh, to there is fee for cable but not for um, providers through the internet and what ended up happening was there was a lot of opposition to this according to representative Freiburg um, because of the extra fee and there was just he said just a really strong campaign against it and um, I mean 
Uh, so next year, you know, can, continuing on with these and capital investment or the bonding bill, uh, you know, ran out of time uh, as well, which was quite, you know, unfortunate because that would have, the proposal was near a billion dollars uh, for wastewater treatment, roads, bridges, other just investments across the state of Minnesota that uh, are, are needed. Um, so uh, that that will, I mean, we'll find out like how the impacts of that not passing in the next, you know, few years, but again, there's a, a next year to do that. All right, so um, ongoing advocacy climate change task force, we meet every month. Uh, and as MEP, um, you know, with MEP, we, we look at some of these updates and that and so if you want to attend those meetings and learn more about what actually did pass and like how these policies will be implemented with regards to climate change, uh, we provide um, updates monthly and it's a really great time to just learn about different issues as well, such as regulatory accountability. That is something that uh, the league, we hosted a presentation on recently and um, some members are really interested in getting involved in that who heard the presentation uh, on CCTF. So if you know that's something we'll, we'll be sharing out more about what advocacy looks like uh, with regards to to that and the advocacy program action team meetings sort of just our our monthly meetings um, our observer lobby corps members uh, can attend also um, if if you're a program chair or an action chair for your local league but also anybody can attend so if you want to email me uh, after this and get onto those calls we will talk about advocacy updates during the legislative session, but also some of those ways that we're implementing these policies um, and just updates from your local league about programs coming up um, that we can share uh, or, or statewide programs that you'd like to see and just a way for us to really coordinate our advocacy across the league. So it's a great opportunity. And also um, the new election laws uh, that passed, uh, we have them in a PowerPoint form, not this that passed last week, but 2023. And I'm sure that Paul um, can provide me with something too on the State Voting Rights Act if if we want to do more in-depth information on that. Um, we have letter the editor templates too. So if you want to, if, if you feel like members of your community don't know about some of these election laws that passed, uh, that we have them, many of them now into a, a shorter format, just like a few paragraphs. Um, it's uh, on our web page and, and will be shared through all member news about uh, ways that you could just kind of copy and paste and send that off to uh, your local newspaper, which we really want to support and something that will continue to prioritize as an issue of local news and democracy um, that just kind of aside as we go forward. So we still have a few minutes for questions um, and these are our emails, um, but uh, again, Thank you um, to everybody who has been a part of our advocacy at the Capitol this session and just everyone even for actually following along too. I mean, it really makes a difference that um, you are reading our Capitol letters and just attending this presentation because these are big changes and um, like it, nobody is going to know about State Voting Rights Act unless, you know, we start by uh, no, educating ourselves about what are the impacts of it. And I mean, it's it's a lot as Paul said, and, and other policies as well, like what is some of these funding sources? And anyways, um, stop sharing my screen. And I see there are some messages in the chat. Um, yeah, and also, yeah, let me know. Um, yeah, no, so there's a- Amy a, has her hand up, I think. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Amy. Sam, I was just hope that if Suzanne is still on, she could answer a few questions about the ERA. I'm wondering if if there's not a special session um, after listening to seven hours of the debate on the House floor until 4.30 in the morning, some of the issues that came up, I'm wondering if the authors are going to address. For instance, there was a real push from uh, op opposition to put in the word age as a protected category and to add the word religion and both were not done. The other thing was there was a big um, arguing point about why couldn't it be in two constitutional amendments. One to have the, 
the pregnancy and abortion stuff and one to have the equal rights. So I'm wondering if Suzanne knows if any of that is going to be thought about before next session. Is, um, is yes. Suzanne still on? I don't know. Yes, I am. This, so my quick answers are um, the legislature decides about the language and they were influenced by a legal group that was put together by gender justice. And actually they included the reproductive rights, um, the ERA, and they combine them because they do better together. Um, the mm. abortion uh, and pregnancy um, support actually tags onto the ERA. The ERA has more support. And so when you combine them, you get a higher level support for both I issues. I see, okay. And so that's a decision they made to combine them. Um, they could be separated, but then you they may lose on the other issue. Not mm -hmm. that other states have that have separated them. They have always won. So just when you look across the country, um, abortion is winning and it is uh, still winning. And so it's just a decision that the legislature makes. And in terms of the question around age, it became um, a legal conundrum because we base so many issues around age, such as driving, such as drinking, such as um, over 55 housing, which I am in. And so would you eliminate senior housing? because it discriminates on the basis of age. It became a sticky issue to, uh, to include age because it has a higher impact for a lot of issues, both on the on the younger side and on the older side. Mm -hmm. So um, religion is already protected and they didn't want to have multiple mm -hmm. pieces of our constitution that may conflict around religion. So they decided, no, yeah. religion's already protected. Let's not... Yeah. And Suzanne, I know all the legal arguments, but 28 states already have some kind of equal rights amendment, and many of them include age. And so somehow that has taken care of. I just think that from the person looking at the ballot, keeping those two things off, it would be a messaging challenge. Uh, I thought, and then come to find out that Planned Parenthood isn't even supporting this. So I thought, gosh, what are we doing here? <laughs> Planned Parenthood made a decision because nationally they are limited in funding and the other states were kind of in crisis mode. And this was a, a positive step that they're doing, spending more of their money um, in other states where they're having to do triage. Um, so that was a decision by their um, national and regional um, leadership. But um, you know, this is the decision. The language ultimately is made by the legislature um, and legislators, what language gets included. Um, we were pretty open. We put forward language and then they kind of picked and chose what, what they wanted to keep. We're, we're the tail of the dog. <laughs> we're <not> the, we're <laughs> well, as we could tell from the day of the last session, I was there with Michelle Witte and we could not believe what happened in the Senate as we got into the final hours, we were just like, what is happening here? Why is the security up here when it should be down on the floor? Yeah. So thank you for all your support on the ERA. The reality is Speaker Hortman wanted it on 26. So we technically, if we hold their feet to the fire, they can pass this next session early because she wanted time and it still could be on the 26th ballot. So even though I felt very frustrated, um, the reality is we can be back and on the 26th ballot was we'll planned. So thank you for all your support. Thank you, Suzanne. That's really good to know um, and, and unfortunate still, but yeah, Kathleen. I just had, oh, just sorry. Uh, you went back on mute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Um, I when we take it up again in the next session, does it have to go through committee hearings? The area yes. one more time. Yes, it has to start at the beginning. So every of uh, the four committee hearings we went through, we have to go through one more time with new representatives. Is that the idea? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to verify that. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I guess the message is that like. Still want to tell people about the ERA because it 
I mean, still act like kind of act like it passed if it's if we will pass again next year or 2026 because we'll still want people to vote. Yeah, but it, we'd only have to go through it again in the house because it no. passed. No, the whole we, the, you have to go through everything. It's back. It's fresh. Okay. Okay. Start Even from I'll... zero. Start okay. from zero. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you for all staying a few minutes extra. And we always kind of end late, but you know, if there are any other questions, uh, feel free to stay on or um, also just email us. Um, but and yeah. Sam, when when are these Friday meetings going to start? The you'll let us know. Yeah. So the the APAT meetings uh, take place every third Friday of the month. Okay. Um, if you are on the Observer Lobby Corps. I'll send out the email as well because I've got everybody on a list. Um, but yeah, if, if you're not, though, um, if, if you have never been invited to an APAT meeting before, um, let me know. I mean, uh, try to, it, it's, it's, a, it's not something you can register online for. You have to email me to, to get the invitation. Um, but also, as Teresa mentioned in the chat, the Office of Secretary of State has Lunch and Learns on the first and third Friday at noon. Um, where they talk about uh, certain things like the language access provisions, uh, automatic voter registration, like some of those policies and, and the implementation of them. Uh, and those um, you can find on our calendar, our events calendar and the link to register for them. Um, but uh, also um, there'll be like, we try to share a lot in our all member news as well. Um, but yeah, so that's in Climate Change Task Force. Uh, you can subscribe to that on our website if you're not already. Um, or just let me know as well, and I can do that as well. But yeah, um, so ha hopefully you all have a good Memorial Day weekend. And thank you again for joining us. Like, I know it's summer now, but <laughs> be inside. But um, so thanks for you. bringing us together each week, Sam. Thank you. Yeah. Really Thank you for the fellow participants. I learned so much from you. Thank you to Paul also, both of you, yes, for what you, you're Paul. doing today. Well, oh, thanks, Kathleen. Yep. Thank you. Thank you all um, for yeah, for sharing and for, for being here.